Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to oscastnetwork.com for details. Life is uncertain. It's okay to feel stressed, anxious, worried, or frustrated. It's normal. With CalHOPE's free and secure mental health resources, it's easy to get the help you and your loved ones need when you need it the most. Call our warm line at 833-317-4673 or live chat at calhope.org today. Hi, it's Patrick O'Driscoll here. You might know me as Pods. I'd like to welcome you to the Adelaide Hills Farmcast. It's the podcast we produce for the love of farming right throughout the Adelaide Hills region. And now I'll hand over to Adelaide Hills Farm Services' very own Belle Baker. Over to you, Belle. Thanks, Pods. Hello, and welcome to this month's Adelaide Hills Farmcast. Today I'm recording at the Littlewood Agapanthus Farm with Tracy Cook. Tracy and husband John have been running Littlewood Agapanthus Farm for a while now, so they're old hands at this farming bizzo. But Tracy tells me it wasn't always smooth sailing. Hi, Tracy. Hi, Bill. <laughs> Thanks for having us at Littlewood Agapanthus Farm. It's a wonderful place to be, beautifully manicured lawns and gardens. What a wonderful little spot or heaven in uh, the Adelaide Hills. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> we do love it. We love getting up every morning to this. Yep. Even on these uh, cool mornings here in the Adelaide Hills. Well, the other thing about being here is that you often get a mist oh, in the lovely. valley. I don't know whether you see that in yes, Northampton, yes. but there's a mist often every morning which then lifts, and that's really quite magical. Oh, so beautiful. So winter's just as good as summer. Excellent. Yes, absolutely. Um, Tracy and I are going to have a little bit of a chat about Littlewood Agapanthus Farm and what they have to offer here for visitors a little later on. But initially, I'm going to work my way through the Adelaide Hills Farm Services farming calendar to see what small acreage or lifestyle farmers and property owners should be thinking about during May. If you're new to the Adelaide Hills Farmcast, we've divided our farm calendar into different sections to cover the main land uses in the hills. I do take liberties with this each month, keeping the information concise and practical. If there is any particular information you're looking for, please let me know. I'm always keen to help and welcome your feedback. Let's roll up our sleeves and get started. (coughs) Everything I'm about to discuss can be found in the show notes for the episode in your podcast player or on our website, adelaidehillsfarmservices.com.au. Livestock. Last month I talked about doing faecal egg counts so that you can understand the worm burden in your stock before drenching. It's not too late to do this, and I would always suggest taking the time to get your samples tested means you can put a drenching program in place that is actually effective. We heard recently we had a client in the the school holidays looking for activities for their kids, so they went out on a poo collection adventure. I think it was a rather grand name for... What a great uh, idea. I know, I know. Can you imagine? Um, You know, because as we know, kids love grot and mud and poo and anything that's a bit gross. Needless to say, I'm told they had a uh, quite a cross-section of samples to choose from in the end, not all of which made it to the uh, faecal egg count selection part of the process. Tell me, Tracy, have you got a pick number here? We have. Right. Yes. Excellent. I knew you would. Yes. A pick number, for those who don't know, is a property identification number. If you have livestock, sheep, cattle, alpacas, goats, even chickens, the lot, that you want to sell, keep as pets, send to an abattoir, or in fact are born on your property, you need a pick number. The cost is nominal, currently $93 for two years. The process can easily be completed online via the PERSA website, and I've included the link in the show notes. The reason I'm suggesting that you get on with this minor administrative job now is that I'm hearing that there is up to an eight to nine week wait for new pick numbers. If you're keen to move some livestock off your property before it gets too wet, or inaccessible, it might be a good idea to start the process now. The penalty for not having a pick number can be a fine of up to $10,000, and that doesn't sound like a whole lot of fun. Mm. I have heard it was enforced recently, probably not to the 10,000 level, but way more than I'd want to be paying. Now, alpacas. I learnt some really interesting facts about alpacas, their anatomy, management needs, and their phobals. I was given a comprehensive handbook on managing alpacas in Australia an easy to read guide that reinforced everything I learned on the day. To their credit, the Australian Alpaca Association encourages all registered breeders to give a copy of this guide to new owners when they sell an alpaca. So if you don't have the guide, perhaps ask for it. 
This is a fabulous initiative that I would like to encourage all breed um, societies, cattle, sheep, goats, horses, the lot, to consider introducing, particularly those that, have, that are breeds that are popular with small lifestyle farmers like Dorper sheep or Angus Murray grey cattle, particularly aimed at those people who don't naturally come from a farming background who could really benefit with key information on how to look after their stock. Do you have alpacas here, Tracy? No, we don't, Bill. Our neighbours do, mm. and we love to see them as we ride by on the horses. Yeah, lovely. Yeah, they're a lot of they're fun, aren't they? They're very cute. They are, they are. If you own an alpaca or three, and you haven't given much thought to them aside from shearing them, then here's a list of things to consider, and a few alpaca facts that just blew my mind. Alpacas are members of the camel or camelids family. As such, they have toes, not hooves. That was news to me. I'd never looked that closely at the feet of an me alpaca. Me either. Mm. Their toes need regular trimming, at least six monthly. Using a pair of garden shears works well. It's recommended that it's done at shearing time, ideally because they're already in the yards and being handled, and again six months after that. If your alpacas are living on hard rocky ground, they may wear their toes down naturally. However, here in the Adelaide Hills, the ground, even when dry, is too soft for that to happen on its own. Alpacas' teeth also need grinding down. Now I can't cope with this. Apparently, you can do this with a big file, one of those industrial metal looking mm. workshop style files, but to be honest, it doesn't sound like much fun to me. We'd suggest, we would suggest, Pods and I would suggest that you would get a she shearer to do it. They generally have all the tools you need to do health checks, etc. Joyland Porter did demonstrate how to file their teeth down with an electric grinder, and I did put that on the socials uh, a little while ago, but I reckon, personally, it's best left to the experts. Mm. In saying all that, apparently alpaca breeders hold regular shearing or health days where you can take your alpaca to their property or back to their property and get it shorn or castrated and the health check's done. This sounds like another brilliant initiative and well worth taking up. If the breeder you got your alpacas from hasn't said anything, perhaps ask or go to the Australian Alpaca Association website, find a local breeder and ask the question. Now, May is the ideal time to administer their annual vaccines um, if you didn't do it at shearing time and a drench. You always shear in the summer because alpacas um, are really do struggle in the cold. Uh, so shearing is only ever done in the summer months. Alpacas are generally vitamin D deficient. It's recommended that vitamins A, D and E are administered together subcutaneously. Alpacas are very good at regurgitating and this can mean that your precious vitamins and, and or drench end up on the ground. That could get a little bit expensive and we get it done before the cold, wet winter sets in in the Adelaide Hills. Now, big question, how do you know if your alpaca is deficient in vitamin D? It's an excellent question. I'm so pleased you asked, Tracy. I know, right? <laughs> you, may know, you may notice your alpaca lying on its back with its stomach facing the sun. This is their way of absorbing vitamin D. How Which amazing. I know, right? So if your alpaca's lying there, legs in the air, sunning itself, it's not trying to be dead. It's trying to sun itself. <laughs> However, apparently, if it's facing the other way, away from the sun, you might have slightly more problems than oh. vitamin D deficiency. <laughs> so got to be on the lookout for the sun in those sort of scenarios. But I think wow. it's, it's fascinating. That is fascinating. Yeah, yeah. So it, it might seem like common sense to some, but I have to admit that this next bit, did I hadn't given it any thought. If you want your alpaca to, uh, or your alpacas to act as guardians or um, to protect your lambs, you need to introduce them to the flock of sheep at least a month before lambing. It makes sense, really. Yes. This will uh, allow time for your alpacas to bond with the flock and then they will intuitively protect the lambs. If you have too many alpacas to sheep, i.e. the ratio is too high, the alpacas will form their own flock and not bond with the sheep at all. Now, I get it now that someone's told me that is common sense. Well, you know, it never ceases to amaze me, but herds flock together. Yes. And we've got one guinea fowl that thinks it's a horse. Yes. And it lost all of its flock and now it's herded with, with the horses. Right. It never leaves them. Wow. Yeah. And I, so I think things do flock together. Yes. Yeah. It, it makes sense it now I'm being sense. told about it. And but they it protect didn't each me. other and, yeah. and look out for foxes, etc. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, now for the fun stuff, if that, we didn't think that was fascinating enough. And who knew I'd be raving on about alpacas? Who knew that I would actually... I mean, seriously, I love them. They're Did gorgeous. you? I know, aren't they? Um, Potty's getting me an alpaca for Christmas. Oh, Can't wait. lucky you. Yes, I know, right? Um, did you know, well, how do you, do you know how to tell the difference between a male and a female alpaca? No. No, other than, of course, if you've got them in the yards and you have a, have a physical look. look. Yeah. Male alpacas pee forward 
in spurts. And female alpacas pee backwards through their back legs in a steady stream. <laughs> Mind blown. Seriously, who knew? Who that? knew? I mean, who, no. so, yeah. who knew? So I've spent a lot of time in the last so week. So all you need to do is watch them wee. Watch, watch them wee. So I spent a lot of time in the last week staring at alpacas in random paddocks going, are you a male or a female? <laughs> anyway. Also, the other interesting thing about alpacas, um, female alpacas, um, they have what's called an induced ovulation. They don't ovulate regularly like other animals and women. They ovulate when a male alpaca is introduced to the yards or the paddock. Handy. So, I, I know, Handy. right? I, yeah, I think it's great. I mean, so and then they don't have to go through all that PMT and everything else. <laughs> <laughs> unless it's necessary. Unless it's necessary, absolutely. So I just thought that was great. So that also means you don't have to get everything in sync if you would. Like, it it's just mm. makes, it's great. So you don't have to time everything with its cycle. You just, nice. yeah, cool. And the other thing, and, and see, I don't know, I'm probably just a little bit fangirling on the alpacas at the moment, but have you ever thought about how you would pregnancy test an alpaca? How you, no, how, I haven't had that thought. No, no, that, and I hadn't either. But what they do, breeders do what's called a spit-off. Huh. Yeah, so this is what happens. So they line all the female alpacas up and then they introduce a male. And if they are pregnant, they will spit at the male. Right? So like a defence mechanism. If they are not pregnant, they won't spit. They'll probably sit down or cush, I think the word is, to, to be, attract them to, attract, to be mated. Oh, my God. Right? So, and it's 95% accurate. So who needs to spend money on a vet when you've got alpacas? Fabulous. How cool is that? Yeah. And, and it's been tested. You know, these people the other day were saying, well, they weren't sure, so they bought the male alpaca back in a few days later and um, same thing happened. It, it works. Wow. I know, right? No, but it's, it's just evolutionary Amazing. animals. Amazing. Yeah. All right. So that's the fun stuff. So get back onto your productive gardens. Now, do you have vegetable gardens and things here yes. as well? Yes. yes of course we you do. You've got your... an orchard and a veggie garden. Yes. Yes. All right. Uh, so now's the time to give your garden a bit of love. It's the perfect time to add fertilizers to your soil um, and get your garden beds ready for planting again. If you've been using the same soil, perhaps in a raised garden bed, my personal fave, because last time I looked, rabbits can't jump, so I'm yeah. into raised garden beds, it can be a good idea to empty it all out and give it a full refresh. I've been hearing a lot about raised garden beds being prepared in layers, starting with a type of weed matting or cardboard, followed by twigs and branches, then adding compost and finally a, a good soil mix. The jury's out as to whether this is a really a good way to go. I get the idea in principle, to be honest, I do. But surely, when everything starts to settle, you'll find yourself having to top up the soil. Tracy, what do you? Is that what you do? Well, I follow the Hugel bed right thing. Okay, um, which, we which need to Google that. You can Google. Yes. But I have found that it really, really works well. Okay. So I did a couple of experiments. Good. With my garden beds. And yes. I've only got them raised a little bit. So mm -hmm. I don't have like a, a big raised garden. Yeah. We do have rabbits. Yes, good. Um, I mean, only because that means I'm not alone. No. <laughs> Sorry. So um, so what you do with the Hugel, this Hugel system mm -hmm. is uh, you put down big logs all on the bottom. Layer, right. Right. Big yeah. logs. And you think to yourself, oh, gee, um, you know, I should break them up or something. No, you don't. You just put the big logs that you get from the paddock. Yeah. Uh, and put them all down. Then you put in your compost. We yeah. make our own compost. So right. uh, we collect horse poo. Yeah. And oak leaves particularly because they're wonderful. Right. And, Writing this down, everybody. And grass oh. clippings and everything else. And we have big piles which we then um, overwinter. Yeah. And, and through the summer, we try to make them get up to a pretty high temperature. So that kills the weed seeds. And you, wow. And then we use that in the garden bed on top of all the logs. Yeah. Um, and we often will let it sit, particularly over winter yeah. for, for a while. Uh, and those garden beds have been the best produce for me than anything else. Wow. Yeah. Um, and, and what happens, I think, the idea of the logs underneath is that they just generally break down slowly in time, they're organic it, matter. Do they not go mouldy? No. No. Well, no, no. you don't see them no, because they're no, covered, they're covered yeah. with And do you reuse dirt. those logs the next year or do you, how often do you regenerate uh, well, your Well, I've left, left it for the last two or three years and I just top up with some compost each year. Mm -hmm. But... 
uh, apparently, uh, depending on the size of your logs, I mean, you can probably leave it for quite a few years. Wow, that is that is fantastic. Well, that's what I'm trying this year. We have plenty of wood and everything around the place, so I'm definitely going to be um, giving that a go. How do you do with weeds on the bottom? Do you put a weed matting or cardboard? Or nothing. do you scoop it all out? For, there's nothing. Nothing. No, just on top of Grass. the ground. Or well, just... no, it's not grass really in it's... the orchard, it's, but it is weeds. I mean, we have marshmallow, we have cape weed, we have all right. sorts of things. Um, we've pulled a lot of that out, we've sprayed a lot. But on those garden beds, basically, I pulled the big stuff, just put the logs on the top yeah. and the compost. Yes. Done deal. Right. Amazing. You are making this a whole and, lot more simple than well, I had it. Well, I, I like anything simple and I'm really <laughs> into no-dig gardens too. Oh, Yes, yeah. yes. Child, yeah. I don't know whether you know Charles Dowding, you look at his stuff, but the no-dig no, gardens but I'm writing that down are really as well. good. So if, the less you disturb the soil, the less weeds you're going to get. And okay. that is something that we found when we mm. first moved here because yes. we did a whole lot of stuff that was really dumb Yes, um, and found that it made us have a lot more work. Yep, yep. And look, the same principle in larger broadacre cropping, etc. The more you till the earth, the more you actually bring those seeds the, the weed seeds up. That's exactly, exactly right. Okay. Right. Well, that is really interesting. Now, the other thing, and I haven't seen any around here because I think you're pretty diligent, but I don't think we've hit full on snail season yet because the soils are still warm and we haven't had a lot of rain. Snails and slugs are best spotted first thing in the morning when they come out from their hiding spots, often under agapanthers. Do you find that? We do have snails in the agapanthus. Yeah. Mm. But controlled, I imagine. I mean, you know. Look, we actually don't do anything about the snails in the agapanthus. Right. Because we find They're that, vigorous enough. Um, yeah, the agapanthus are vigorous enough that they withstand the snails. Yeah. Um, and the snails basically only go for the so soggy yellow... Oh, yes, yes. ...leaves yeah. that, that are yes. sort of underneath the agapanthus yes. anyway. which I saw on one of your YouTube videos. You actually demonstrated that really well. Right, yeah. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so you do... Yeah, we do get snails. They do like agapanthus... Um, but they don't do much damage to the agapanthus. Right, okay. Good to know. Yeah. All right. Now, look, you can use snail pellets if you don't have small pets around, but truly there is no better feeling than the crunch of a big snail under your foot. Absolutely. That is just one of the best things. Now, uh, moving on to bigger pastures, Pods and I sat down with Michael Bowden of Hills Farm Supplies recently. Bodes and Anthony Pierce uh, have been running Hills Farm Supplies for over 10 years now, and we often partner with them when we're helping our clients. Bodes' biggest message for May was to look out for capeweed, geranium, flatweed, barley grass and silver grass. To be honest, he sort of went on a bit. There were more than I could write down quickly as they emerge as the paddocks green up, which makes sense. The ideal time to hit these weeds, he says, is at the two to four leaf stage when their leaves are growing and their ability to take up chemical, if you're going to deal with it, is at its greatest. Um, hitting them at this point also means that they don't get the ch a chance to outcompete the good grasses or pasture before they get up and going. If you're not sure what weeds you've got or whether they are in numbers that may need control, take a photo and email it or t uh, and take it into your local agricultural reseller and see how you go from there. How do you get on with weeds here? Uh, well, we've got plenty of them. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, but... I'm pleased to hear that we're not alone here. That's great. <laughs> so in the pasture... We do spray. Yes. And we wait until the clover has three or four yes, leaves that's right. on it. Yes. And then uh, we have somebody in to spray for cape weed. Yes. I anticipate this year it's going to be shocking because last year it was so wet we mm -hmm. were unable to spray. Uh huh. Right. So this year we'll be right on it. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, and then, of course, because we have manicured gardens and be because of the weddings, etc., mm -hmm. we've got to be onto it all the time. And yes. so what we've done over the years, and we've learnt this really makes a big difference, is when it rains, you know that you're going to get these little weeds emerging. Yeah. Kill them then. <laughs> <laughs> Do not yes. hesitate. Yes. Just kill get them. Get on them. Get out there, spray them. Yeah. Um, we try, we've, we've tried to do as minimal as we can is, in terms of using sprays. Yes. We don't really like to use it. No, but here no. you have to um, unless, you know, you, well, you're, a, you're just going to get, operation, you're, you're you're gonna get so. you know, taken over with yeah, it. Yeah. However, we've reduced our spraying a lot and the, how we've done that is by mulching. So mm. what we do is we let it rain, we let the weeds emerge. Yes. We spray them and then we heavily mulch. Yes, yeah. After that, 
you all you have to do is go along and pick out the odd ones mm -hmm. that are weak yes. in their root system anyway because of the mulch. Yes. And it's so much easier. Right, right. And the other thing I was saying before, Bill, about not digging too much. Yes. If you don't disturb the soil too much, yes. you're going to be a lot better off. As soon as you start digging soil and, and all of that, you're going to get a huge amount of weeds emerging. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's good advice. Excellent advice. Uh, the other thing uh, to be aware of is that, that window for spraying blackberry and other woody weeds is closed now. This is because the plants become dormant in the cooler months, meaning that the potential kill you get from the application of chemical is greatly diminished. The plants just don't take up the chemical like they would in their growing phase. So we're still getting... Um, so true. Yeah, yeah. We look, and we still get phone calls about blackberry, but we do tell people just to hold off now until November, December, um, and we can go from there. Because they really are not going to grow a lot no. in this winter period anyway. No. And it, it, it's an absolute waste of time and money because mm. if the plant's not taking it up, yeah. it's just a waste of chemical. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, our conversation with Bodes then moved on to pest management in pastures. Um, Bodes and Pods met at Ag College at Roseworthy back in the day, as, so they have quite a shared history. The conversation was quickly railroaded by a rather hilarious recollection of them both failing an entomology project on red-legged earth mite. Oh. Now, Bodes tells me uh, he eventually got a pass after looking over the shoulder of his then girlfriend, now wife, Alice, <laughs> and doing a little bit of uh, seeing what Alice had done. Now, I went to school with Alice, so we have this whole, I know, Adelaide. Yes, Adelaide. Sm I know, small ridiculous, world. isn't it? Small world, small world. Of course, both Pods and Bodes promised, made me promise that I wouldn't tell anyone, so... There we have it. Uh, but I digress. So my point being, red-legged earth mite remain dormant in the soil in the warmer months. The eggs hatch when we get a series of cold and wetter days. So just now, they still wouldn't be out now, early May. You're probably, if you're listening to this early May, you're really not going to see any because we just haven't had a wet enough May. But once, they, once it gets wet, they get active. They love to hide under broadleaf weeds like capeweed. Um, and the way to find them is just to literally look for the damage. If you take a broad or a helicopter view of your pasture, you may notice some yellowing areas. And also in large lawn areas, they, they tend to hide in, in those covered areas near fence lines, etc., just like snails. Oh. But, um, so, but if you take a helicopter view of everything and you see some yellowing areas, then go in and take more of a macro view and turn the leaves over and you'll probably find red-legged earth mites. The next thing to consider is whether they're in numbers that warrant chemical intervention. Keeping in mind that when you kill the bad bugs, you're also killing the good bugs. So exactly how much damage are you going to be doing? In Bodes' words, and I love this, he said, it's about good stewardship of your land. It's about observing the potential threats and assessing whether the risk is worth the reward. And I love hearing that yes. from somebody in the industry who makes money from selling the chemicals that yes. do this, but that there is still an observation that, you know, blanket chemical killing of bugs and weeds isn't always the solution. Exactly. Love it. Bell, can I just ask you a question? Yes. Are the red-legged earth mites sap suckers? Yes. Do they, do they, so they, yes. they suck the sap of, right. of the plant. Okay. Yes. All right, yeah. yeah. If they're not, pods and bows will correct me <laughs> and uh, I will do a retraction in the next podcast uh, if that is not the case. Sure. But I do believe they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So hopefully that will give you a few ideas of what um, you could be thinking about uh, and planning to do on your property now. I'll be back next month with some more timely jobs to add to your to-do list. And don't forget, all the notes are in the show notes for this episode at adelaidehillsfarmservices.com.au. Now, before I chat with Tracy, I just want to play the interview that I did with Pods about fencing materials and where the industry is up with that. For this month's interview, we're doing something a little bit different. Uh, we thought it might be a good time to catch up on some information that's coming out about fencing materials. So whilst I don't usually record the conversations Pods and I have, uh, I thought it might be a good idea to do that on this occasion. So we th I thought I'd find out what's the latest information you have on the supply of fencing materials, Pods. Thanks, Bill. And uh, it is a good time to uh, discuss this. I have found uh, that Fencing materials are getting harder to access. I think I can break this down into two categories, being the timber-based products, being our posts, CCA, creosote, and rails, and then the second category being our steel-based products, being wire, cyclone, steel droppers, steel posts, etc. Both are becoming increasingly hard to access. 
I think the timber-based products are being driven by the fact that... You mean the shortage of them? Or the shortage of the timber-based products is driven by the fact we're competing with the housing industry and the building industry uh, with the advent of the 2020 Home Builders Grant. Yep. So the building industry is going gangbusters and we're having to compete against the building industry. Mm Mm-hmm coupled together with the fact that some of our timber mills are currently out of production due to the floods in New South Wales and Queensland of last month. And then with our steel-based products, I think this is partly or mainly due to the fact of it being a perfect storm in the agricultural sector at the minute. Beef prices are at record highs. Lamb and mutton prices are very, very strong as are wool prices and I think as we all acknowledge, farmers are very good at spending money and rightly so are putting money back into their own business by doing a lot of uh, fencing. Or investing in their infrastructure. Investing in their infrastructure. And And that's not just fencing, is it? That's We're also finding that with cattle yards, the availability of... Cattle yards, yeah. sheep yards, shearing sheds and the like. Right, okay. So is that a short-term or a long-term problem? I, you know, is fencing over or do we? is this just a short-term delay in supply? I think it's just a short-term blip on the radar, but okay. it's certainly something we have to be aware of at the moment. Okay. Are there any alternatives to the steel or the wood products? I guess the only product I can think of off the top of my head is the Wood Shield product. Yeah, right. Manufactured in Melbourne. That is a timber-based product that is untreated, but it has a very, very hard plastic coating around it. Uh, it and that's fully, a recycled product, isn't it? And that is a recycled product, environmentally friendly. Mm. Uh, organic, com- certified organic. Completely certified organic and uh, is a very, very strong product. Yeah. Okay, so there is an alternative if you want to go down that track instead of waiting for the traditional wood products. For Absolutely. Yeah, okay. With the steel, you know, the wire and things, there's often two types. There's the Australian made, which is our preference, the Waratah products, but there's also another one that is comes from, the steel comes from overseas. Is that a shortage problem as well or just the Australian made products? Which is I the, think it's across the board, Barry. Right, okay driven by the fact that there's so many farmers out there wanting to reinvest yeah. in their infrastructure on property. Okay. So other than going to, you know, a wood shield product as an alternative, what can we do about it? What, what can our clients do about it or what can we help our clients do I about it? I think one of the only real ways we can offset the problem to some degree is if there's any people out there who are just starting to think about a fence or part thereof of a fence that needs replacing or indeed they're wanting to change a grazing system upcoming and put in some smaller paddocks, whatever it be. I think now more than ever we've always said uh, planning makes uh, perfect and this is an exact example of that, that plant thinking and planning a longer way out and then talking to your reseller, talking to your contractor, putting some orders in place quite some time out is going to offset your requirement or, of waiting for Or any for delay material. that might happen. Yeah. And any delay that may happen. Yeah, yeah. And so one of our um, pet things we love to talk about is when somebody uh, has a new... They've purchased or are about to purchase a new pup and it's due to arrive in say eight weeks time it's been born and you're waiting for it and what we generally say have always said that when you purchase your dog that that's the time to think about secure safe fencing for your dog because when it arrives and and absolutely and but once it arrives it's almost too late and with just very little ability for us to help you out with your fencing at short notice absolutely spot on all right thanks potty it's been fun Let's do it again. Good one, Bailey. Thank you. That was Pods and I talking all things fencing materials and their availability at the moment. If you'd like any more information about fencing products, we encourage you to speak with our local agri reseller or give us a call on 0429 130 673. We're always happy to help.
Tracy, thank you for hosting us today. We're recording this farmcast out in amongst the Agapanthus. Well, not exactly. We're under the pavilion, aren't we? It's Are you able to describe our surrounds that, and what you have here at Little, Little Wood Agapanthus Farm? Sure. We are at the top of a hill, a, gent a gentle slope, I suppose, and we're sitting in the pavilion area, which is where we hold the weddings and mm -hmm. functions. Mm -hmm. And we're looking out over the gardens, over the lawn, into the little sunken garden bed and the trees, and looking out into the pasture. Oh, that's our hay paddock actually yeah. out there. It's a wonderful view from up here. You can see quite some distance, can't you? You can, mm. yes. Mm. Have you always been open to the public and run events here, or is that a fairly new initiative? We're open for Agapanthus sales Fridays, Saturdays and Sundays mm -hmm. generally, not public holidays. Yes. And we think that we're going to take August off. Oh, for the first time in five years. Right, good idea, um, excellent. Yes, but, uh, and we, we have uh, often, in the season when all the flowers are out, we often have tours, bus tours and that sort of thing. A lot of seniors come in, which we Lovely. absolutely love oh, them. Oh, how fantastic. Yes. Yep. Um, so I've watched a few of your YouTube videos and I must admit I found them really, really engaging and I've learnt quite a lot. I've definitely been dividing up my Aggies the wrong way. Uh, and, uh, and leaving them clumped up for way, way too long. Have you always been an avid gardener or have you been sort of quick to learn on the job, so to speak? Well, a bit of both. Right. So you've been here six years? Yes. Yeah. And um, I have always been an avid gardener. Yes. I have always loved having, doing my own veggies and eating my own produce and that sort of thing. Um, and John as well. Um, my sister did horticulture, so she's been a great help handy, to us. Wonderful. Extremely handy. Mm -hmm. And um, But when we got here, look, I thought there was just a blue and white agapanthus, you know, the standards that you see mm -hmm. everywhere. I had no idea that there were 200, in 200. varieties in the family. And we've got 20 varieties, some wow. of them quite rare. I'm looking forward to having another look around in a minute, actually. Um, so it's been a huge learning curve. And we also... When we bought the property, we didn't think that we were going to buy, you know, 58 acres, which we have. So we've actually had to learn how to manage the pastures and how to manage yeah. the animals and yeah. all of those sort of things. So it's a huge learning curve. Yeah, yeah. Um, and what, uh, what are you doing in the garden at the moment? What jobs have you got lined up for May? Well, we always say that autumn is the most important time in the garden. Right. So that's when you're setting up for everything else. Mm -hmm. And we have... In January, coming up this January, the first time, we're doing an SA Open Gardens. Oh, are you? So we're absolutely I love going to those. beside ourselves right. about, oh my God, we can't even have one weed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I look forward to I'm going to talk about that in the, uh, well, December, January podcast. How fantastic. <laughs> oh, thank you. Mm. But, you know, so we're really trying very hard to prepare for that. But yes. in any case, autumn, I think, is the time when you have to pre prepare for the rest of the season. Mm -hmm. So we are really busy. We don't divide our agapanthus until April, May. Right. Generally. Yeah. You can do it any time of the year because they're so hardy. But yes. the best time for us is April, May. The soil's still a bit warm. Yes. But you, it's, you haven't got those burning days. Yeah. And um, you're looking forward to a bit of rain coming. So yes. you're not having to... We're not on Maine's water here. So no, we have no, to right. conserve water. Yes. We're doing all of our pruning because we want to burn everything off that we've had from last year, mm -hmm. uh, which yes. is coming up. Our big burn-offs are coming yes, up. And yes. we want to reduce... 30th any, of April, I'm waiting. That's yeah. right. Yep. We want to reduce any fuel load mm -hmm. ready for fire season next year. Mm -hmm. So um, we've got huge burn piles to do. Uh, but we, because we've had spring growth and summer growth and now a lot of things are sort of dying off, we need to cut everything back. Mm -hmm. Um, and do you get in there with a sort of Pods's idea of gardening is to get in with a chainsaw or are you slightly more, or a hedge trimmer? Are you slightly more we, elegant than that? No. Oh, <laughs> no, absolutely not. We, we do, after, <laughs> uh, after the agapanthus have finished flowering, we deadhead every single yes. one of them. That's 300,000 at least flowers oh, that we deadhead. Oh, my goodness. Right. Um, that's a big job here and we've just finished right. wow. that. Um, and that takes us some months. With the miniature agapanthus, we use a hedger for those. Yes. We have lots of hedges here and we yes. use electric hedges. Uh, but 
Some of the hedges, um, particularly when we arrived here, were just overgrown and everything was too big. Mm -hmm. So we have used chainsaws and really chopped yep, it back. And, and started it's again. worth yep. doing that well because otherwise every five minutes you're out with your electric yes. hedger. Yes. You know, so yep. Um, yep. If, if you think ahead, you try and save yourself some work. Yes, yes. And look, I was going to ask you about how you manage snails and my own personal nemesis, the rabbits. Now, snails, you know, you, you're pretty okay with. The rabbits, though? Look, we do have rabbits here, and um, I'm often talking to a lot of my clients. Um, and apparently at the moment in Mount Barker, they are plague proportions. They are, that's right. Um, and I've got lots of gardeners coming in saying, please tell me that the rabbits don't eat agapanthus because yeah. we cannot give anything in, in the garden. No, yeah, yeah. Luckily, they don't eat agapanthus. No. Very occasionally, on a miniature agapanthus, you'll see a rabbit nibbling on a root, mm -hmm. but they don't generally kill them. No. And so we do have, and we did have when we first arrived here, a lot of rabbits. So we've done a system where we put out baits of pindone. Yes. And also we shoot them. Yes, excellent. So we talked about um, how to manage rabbits in the last episode and Rob Murphy from the Hills and Fluria Landscape Board suggested that you actually need a multi-pronged approach. You know, any one thing wasn't going to be enough, but I that agree. together with the, you know, the pindone and shooting, but also to destroy their burrows as well yes. so that the new ones don't come in and just take over so that's exactly excellent. right and right. sometimes if you're planting young plants and i've had this problem um, they'll really go for the young plants so yes. i have glass cloches that i put oh. over young plants until they've grown up enough that the rabbits aren't so interested. uninterested yeah right because yeah. I, I must say in my own garden the only thing the rabbits aren't eating are my agapanthers yeah which uh is very exciting because it means i still have something to look at yes, in the garden that's exactly right. um <laughs> yes it's fantastic and now look we've heard anecdotally um or perhaps a little bit more so that there are a lot of our european wasps around at the moment we've noticed quite a few we're on the other side of little hampton to you um, to where we are now, have tell me this is oh, a leading question. It, Come on, Tracy. They have you are got my any nemesis? I have so much. <laughs> um, look, we we do have a European wasp this year is particularly bad. Why do you think that is? Because we've had a mild um, season. Yes. Uh, we had a fairly mild winter. Mm -hmm. If we get a very cold winter, it will kill them. Okay. And in Europe, that's why they are not so bad, because in where, when it's freezing cold and snowing in yes. Europe, they will actually die. Okay. So each, each year the nest dies. Yeah, right. In Australia, we don't get that because we have... Even here in the hills, does that not get... Well, I think it does. But we did have a mild winter last but year. But we had a mild yes. winter. Yes. We didn't have those, you know, zero and one degrees so much. No, no, where, we you didn't. Know, where you get up and you have to chip the chooks water, <laughs> ice off the chooks water. Yes, yes. Um, and so I think that's one of the reasons we've got more this season. So they probably haven't died off as much no. in their hives. And so you can get hives where there's 100,000 wasps when if they don't die really? off. Yeah. Normally the workers will die and the queen goes down into the hive yes. and then keeps laying eggs, you know. So, um, so that's been a problem, I think, this year. And I have done numerous things to try okay. and kill Come them. On, and tell I've us. studied this. All right, Absolutely. okay. So one of the problems, because we do weddings and functions, we can't have oh, European you can't have, wasps. No, of course. You, know, it, you can't have the terrible. bride getting hysterical over no. a wasp bite. No, you that's cannot. bad. And you don't want them around your food. No, no. So one of the things that we do is try to make sure that every bit of food that they might be interested in is not available. Removed, yep. So unfortunately, if you've got pets like dogs and cats and that sort of thing, you've got to get rid of all that food yes. because they'll be after it. Yes. They have an absolute flurry of activity February, March, April now. Right. Ready to try and get all that food, bring it back to the, ah. to the nest. Yes. Uh, ready to, to, to breed so those or... babies yes. are yes. all fed. Yes. So um, if you... You can track them down. So if you put food out, they particularly like chicken. Okay, writing that down. Particularly like chicken, I've found. I've done, gone through all the cat food with the sardines and everything else, but yeah. I've, I've found... I've prawns. They like prawns, but I'm not about to they go They love and... snapper heads. Right. Um, <laughs> that could be smelly if they I don't. I haven't particularly found chicken yeah. they like. Okay. Um, I've put out things like jam and honey because they like sweet things as well. And so then you watch where they're coming from. And if you can, 
provide some sort of meat that they can pick off a little bit of because it slows their flight down. Oh, okay. And then you can see where they go. Ah. And you know how when they come down to food, they hover and they go yes. from right to left, right to yes. left, really annoying. Yes. Then they'll settle on the food. Once they pick a little bit of that food off, they'll go up and they will fly straight. Ah, okay. So if they're coming from the you nest... really are. Uh, you know, you, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. They've got no chance with me. <laughs> uh, how so fantastic. if they're coming from the nest to the food, they will fly straight. Mm -hmm. If they're coming from the food to the nest, they'll fly straight. Okay. If you see them flying straight, you think, right, they're coming from that direction. Okay. Now, it's very hard to then, because they could be up to, you know, 500 metres away. Wow. Yes. So then you keep moving your food until uh. you find, okay, we're getting a lot more wasps <laughs> coming. We're getting, you know... And then you start looking generally in the ground mm. and it will be a hole. How big? Look, it can vary, really? but it's usually about 50 yep. cent so, or perhaps a bit bigger. Yeah, right. And it's so very, very often next to a fence post. Really? I have killed six west wasp nests all next to fence posts, right, right on the fence the, post. The, the holes in the ground that I've been looking at have been way smaller than that. So I'm, they, and I haven't been able to, I haven't seen anything going in no. and out, but I've got a if, few of if those. If there's nothing they're... going in and out, that's not so a So are they always going in and out? Always going in and out. Right. Except in winter when they're dormant, yeah, maybe. Yeah, but, they, yeah. but at the moment, oh, they're, they're nuts. They're yeah. going in and out all the time. Wow. Um, so there have been a couple of nests that I've killed that have not been right next to um, fence posts, yeah. but they're often near. Why, why do you think that is? Uh, I think because when you drill a hole for a pen, fence post, yes. probably you've disturbed the soil and you've made it easier. easier for them. The soil's not compacted. Yes. So they can get in there and they can dig out that soil. You know what? I'm loving chatting here, but I'm in a rush to get home to uh, check out my... <laughs> <laughs> to go for a walk around the fence post to check it out. Yep. That is, um, I haven't known where to start. All so right, so that's what you do. And then once you find out where they are, yes. you wait. Okay. Right. Do really? not approach them at daytime. Oh, okay. Otherwise, you, you're going to get stung. Yeah, yeah. So they wait till it's dark. You get your torch and you put a little bit of red cellophane over the torch because right. they don't react to that red light. Okay. Right, and then you get your gloves on and everything else, just in case. I, I do, and then I, you go out. I did not know this conversation was going to go here. This <laughs> is fabulous. You go out with your wasp yes. stuff. I find the powder best. Right. It's about seven bucks from Bunnings. Right. Um, you go out to the hole and you, you'll see them in the inside of the hole. Right. Don't disturb them too much because they will come out so at you, do you see, at you, night. Oh, yes, you see them. You can see them right in the hole there. And then you puff that powder <laughs> down the hole and, and you want to put a it? good 100 grams down there because it's got to go right down in to kill the queen. Right. And that's it. They're gone. <laughs> Tracy, wow. I feel like we might, uh, this, this interview may have got a little bit longer than I had planned. <laughs> so I think it, no, it's wonderful. <laughs> It's wonderful. I think it's very worthwhile. I feel like I need to have perhaps done, you know, the feature interview, you know, uh, of this. But we might get you back again because that is amazing information. Because I wanted to ask you, I hear cattle like eating, eating acropanthus. That's they great. Do. We don't have they time love, for any of that. They love the um, <laughs> seed heads. Yeah, right, the seed heads particularly. Not... And they do like the leaves. And yep. as I was saying before, my husband John had them analysed and they are an A-grade fodder for cows. That is remarkable. So because we feed all our Everyone cows. has acropanthus in the hills. Yeah. Um, probably just the one or two varieties, common varieties. But uh, next time they're trimming them all, throw them over the fence to the yeah, cattle. They love them. Watch the they cattle grow. Running. How fantastic. That is wonderful. Look. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you so much for Absolute hosting us today. Um, it's been, wow, my mind is blown, not just by alpacas, but now by European wasps. That is amazing. <laughs> and look, if anyone's interested in finding out more about the Littlewood Agapanthus farm um, or booking a function here, we'll put the uh, contact detail, your contact details on our show notes. Thank you. Um, and people can go from there. And I think we'll do a little bit of a cutout from this and uh, feature that as well. Fabulous. So thank you so much, Tracy. Thanks, Belle. Lovely to meet you. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Adelaide Hills Farmcast. We hope you found it really helpful and just a little bit entertaining. Uh, you can leave comments and send questions on the show notes page for this episode, which is on our website, adelaidehillsfarmservices.com.au. Just click on Farmcast and look for the May episode. Thanks for listening to the Adelaide Hills Farmcast. Belle and I hope you found it helpful. 
You can leave comments and send questions on the show notes page for this episode, which is on our website, adelaidehillsfarmservices.com.au. Just click on Farmcast and look for the May episode. Life is uncertain. It's okay to feel stressed, anxious, worried, or frustrated. CalHOPE can help. Access CalHOPE's free and secure mental health resources. Call 833-317-4673 or live chat at calhope.org. Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to oscastnetwork.com for details.